Welcome to part 8 of uh, our application layer module and today I'll be talking about internet video or uh, like this multimedia streaming uh, if we're talking about in general. Uh, there are different uh, modes of uh, multimedia streaming and uh, I'll try to introduce you to at least two different modes uh, as part of this lecture uh, but in general you can think of uh, there is some kind of a raw streaming uh, like raw input of uh, video and audio uh, it can be files, it can be uh, like a real-time capture or something else. Uh, then uh, those, uh, effectively, the inputs are being compressed. Uh, they've been somehow packaged as um, like compressed, uh, packaged, archived, or so forth, and then dumped into the transport layer protocol. And uh, like on the client side, uh, they extracted from the transport layer protocol, uh, kind of converted to uh, video stream, video audio stream, and then decoded and played out. So this is a very, very general concept applying to all, basically all multimedia streaming applications. And depending on how exactly the communication part is operating, and actually it depends on also uh, how the uh, raw video is coming in and, uh, and audios are coming in, whether it's input uh, from the live stream or something already pre-recorded like this lecture, uh, there are slight differences in, the, in, in how things are operating. But in general, this is the picture. Uh, to give you uh, a few <laughs> problems associated with the media streaming. Uh, so first of all, um, kind of these are uh, uh, elements of the video streaming. There is some kind of a streaming server. Sometimes it's uh, your user machine is also acting as a streaming server. Uh, there are clients. There is a, and connected over different networks. Uh, so in sp specifically, there are several problems. And uh, several problems include the uh, rate control. And uh, this, uh, I will explain a little bit later what exactly this rate control means, but essentially, depending on the type of the link, depending on the availability of the bandwidth, uh, the server might need to adjust how much data it's sending to you. So it, depending on how it's adjusting, it can adjust either different quality or adjusting some sending the different stream or there is a several mechanisms how exactly it can be accomplished depending on what kind of stream uh, we're talking about. Uh, the second one is error uh, control. So the error control is slightly different from the rate control uh, because depending on the again a link type you may have enough bandwidth to actually push all the data of the highest stream uh, but you may not uh, have very reliable link. And uh, I, give, I can give you one example is the satellite uh, video, or like a video from satellites. Uh, the capacity of that link is enormous. So the like, satellite can stream tons of tons of tons of information to you, uh, but uh, depending on the cloud, depending on what uh, you see in the cloud, uh, like in the sky, uh, you may have a very kind of flaky uh, reception. And uh, to solve, to address this problem, at least partially, uh, you may need to introduce some form of error control or like some redundancy in, in your transmission and so forth. And finally, there's a issue of the continuous distribution uh, where you actually want to provide some form of a continuous service uh, despite some problems with the internet connectivity and so forth. This is kind of a general problem. And uh, I'll try to focus on the first two aspects, as, at least as the first part of this lecture. Uh, so first of all, uh, the rate control. Uh, I already mentioned there are multiple mechanisms that uh, kind of this rate control can be accomplished. And uh, not so classic approach, but the desire in general to have some form of a scalable compression. Uh, today, uh, the kind of this compression, we have some form of uh, uh, scalable compression, but it's actually not exactly worth scalable. It's more like a multi-rate compression. And I'll try to show you a few examples a, a bit later. But the idea of the scalable compression, uh, which we don't have, <laughs> uh, is uh, there is some form of a base stream that being encoded, like with very, very rudimentary quality. And uh, kind of which, but, uh, which gives you some idea of either the picture or audio or something else. Then you have uh, some kind of enhancement streams 
uh, that introduce additional like quality levels to the video like uh, and the quality levels to the audio so this is uh, their algorithms for that uh, there is some research on that even more uh, but somehow people not really convinced yet or the like, technology is not there yet uh, to actually use this te uh, use technology so what we do today in most of the cases is simply encoding the same video in multiple uh, qu quality levels and uh, simply selecting between different qualities uh, depending on uh, our networking conditions so for example when you're watching uh, this lecture on on the phone i don't know like in a very ba uh, bad environment you're probably going to get like 320 uh, size video uh, versus when you're watching at home on the computer then you're going to get uh, the 1080p uh, quality video uh, finally there is a, a rate filter and a quality of control uh, quality of service feedback uh, I'll talk about the quality of service feedback uh, because it's more specific to one of the protocols like a, a, a conventional protocols and the rate filter is simply a mechanism of, of how exactly the rate control being achieved error control I uh, already mentioned uh, very briefly and uh, there are basically two approaches and the two mechanisms that usually work together so one of them is adding uh, redundant data as part of what is streaming so effectively encoding something add uh, additional in each packet uh, to allow um, a, um, kind of reconstruction of what have been lost if some packet had been lost in the stream so that's one approach and uh, as i mentioned on the slides there is either mdc or fec and uh, like the FPC is uh, the most commonly used uh, approach. And the second type is a concealment of errors. And what it means is uh, when I'm receiving the video, like when I'm receiving a stream of video and I lost a few frames, like a few packets that represent some of the frames, uh, the re receiver can simply do some magic, like simply replay the previous frame, assuming the frame didn't change too much. Uh, if it's audio, it can play the pause, um, which doesn't really reconstruct the, of, of the voice that's being sent out, but may not impact too much the quality. And uh, uh, the slide shows you a few different approaches what can be done uh, with interp interpolation techniques. To give you some idea of the classic multimedia streaming protocols, uh, I, kind of, I summarized them on, on this slide. Uh, so the, the most classic one is, uh, it's somewhere in the middle, is RTP Media Transport Protocol. Uh, what is uh, above, uh, like the first one is uh, some form of a stream description, is just uh, to describe on the appli higher application layer uh, what exactly the stream represents. So we just remember there are some protocols how to describe the content, how to describe the session, and you can also think about the session like in terms of um, voice over IP call because voice over IP is essentially multimedia streaming. It's just not not necessarily video, but uh, kind of it is audio. It is multimedia. Uh, there is one important protocol uh, which is RTSP, uh, important for the purpose of this classic streaming protocols, and is simply is trying to address the issue of some form of a feedback. So that's actually the stream control and the last bullet of a quality of service are kind of interchange and connected together. Uh, and with this RTSP protocol that again I mentioned in a bit more detail later, uh, it allows the consumer or like a client who is receiving the video to give some form of a feedback and hope something will change in the future. But it doesn't really have a full control of what you're going to be receiving. And uh, to give you examples of uh, classic uh, streaming, uh, so one of them uh, is simply audio video conferencing. Uh, so it's either the actual conferencing when you join and talk to multiple people or simply voice over IP calls like Skype, or Google Voice and, and many others. So that would be a kind of very, very classic example of the, uh, of the classic streaming protocols. Um, as I mentioned on the slide, uh, it may not be necessarily the classic RTP protocol, uh, but it's essentially the same thing. It just may be describing things in a slightly different way, but it's all, all the concepts are based on um, RTP. Uh, So-called IPTV or Internet Television Services, uh, uh, they are using actually the classic uh, RTP uh, streaming, RTP-based streaming. And uh, you can also bundle in this uh, broadcast TV today, like uh, all this digital broadcast TV is done in the form of RTP streaming. 
and satellite TV, satellite radio. So they're all uh, doing the same. So they're all using some form of uh, UDP packets or like RTP based packets uh, to send you streams. And on the client side, you kind of trying to infer what you're receiving and decode and process this information. In the next few slides, I will try to give you a few details of uh, RTP and RTCP protocol. And uh, first of all, uh, these protocols are part of the internet standard. And they're primarily designed for the multi-user multimedia conferencing. Um, they, so the protocols, these two protocols actually um, closely have technically closely linked together. Uh, so the one one protocol is defining how to stream uh, streams of the multimedia, and can, I'll, I'll talk a bit more. But effectively, there is a separate stream for the video, separate stream from the audio, and potentially there can be multiple different stream for different qualities of uh, video stream from a single source. And if we're talking about multi-user kind of environment, then we're gonna have multiple streams from each individual party uh, destined to someone, and then. Uh, to the someone I'll, I'll mention later. And uh, RTCP is the, effectively the feedback mechanisms. Every time um, kind of I'm receiving, I'm aggregating the statistics of uh, how well I'm receiving, how many packets I actually lost, and there is some mechanisms to detect this part. And then I'm periodically uh, using RTCP protocol, can uh, uh, send a feedback to the, to the server, so the server can adjust some, some of the parameters of the streams. Technically, the RTP architecture is independent of the underlying transport and network layers, so it's kind of its real um, application layer protocol. Even though it's kind of majority of time is being used on top of UDP, on top of the IP, but it does, doesn't really matter uh, on top of IPv4 or IPv6. So it's kind of completely ignores uh, the concept of the transport and lower layers. Uh, important part that uh, it doesn't uh, kind of it's uh, working on top of the UDP and uh, does not provide any uh, kind of uh, concepts of for quality of service guarantees. It doesn't uh, kind of guarantee that you receive the packets in order. It doesn't guarantee that you receive all the packets and kind of uh, it can reorder kind of you can receive packets if you order stuff. Uh, so it's kind of very, very basic protocol, doesn't really do anything except describing what you're sending. Or like we're describing what being sent out. And to give you uh, two specific use cases, uh, uh, like talking about the, uh, a single uh, kind of very basic multicast uh, broadcast, like some kind of audio webcast service. Uh, so for the UDP or uh, for RTP mm, mm, session to to, to activate, you have to pick a specific multicast address and two UDP ports. And then those two are kind of, they beyond the RTP and uh, RTCP, uh, they have to be defined uh, in, in a specific application. So if you're talking about some form of a Skype or some form of a webcast, then that application is responsible to actually define these ports and the multicast addresses. Or multicast address has to be even defined as part of the some specific deployment. And then uh, all what uh, is needs to be done by the server, or in this case by the speaker, is to create this RTP packet uh, to sp with specific IP header, adding some R UDP header, uh, adding this R RTP header, and including the audio data in it. And that's it. So it's, it has to generate these packets with whenever audio is being generated. It doesn't have to generate them all the time. It's all kind of depends on how exactly audio is being encoded, whether pauses are encoded as audio or they're just not encoded at all. And uh, from the perspective of the receiver, it needs to simply receive this audio and interpret uh, that it's been audio as part of the RTP header and simply play it out. I mentioned the word multicast address. Uh, we'll talk about this more in the networking module, like it's in, in the next two modules. But effectively, there is ability as part of the IP protocol to send a single packet destined to multiple receivers. It's not really working kind of on a global scale, but it's working on uh, smaller environments. It's uh, uh, working in certain cases like in satellite or like a TV broadcast in a similar environments. But the important to note here, uh, like especially when you're talking about the multicast streaming, uh, the fact is uh, there's only one packet sent out towards everybody. And uh, this the only packet sent out in the same quality. And if we have a very big disparity between good links and bad links, the server may adjust to send very bad quality to everybody. 
So that's kind of an important uh, fact to remember. Uh, there are some cheats that I quickly mentioned uh, that the server can technically encode the same uh, audio or video in uh, parallel qualities and then send them either as a parallel streams. Uh, but then it has to be some form of responsibility of the receiver to know that there are two streams available of different qualities that are representing the same thing. And now uh, to define a kind of a little bit bigger uh, audio kind of, kind of conference that not only have one stream of audio but also have some video streams, some text streams and so forth, then for each of those individual streams you have to have a separate RTP session. It can be still within the same, um, effectively within the same um, kind of port numbers of RTP and RTCP. It's just within RTC, RTP protocol, there is a specific identifier of the session. And I'll show you, I think on the next slide, uh, how, what exactly this RTP session ID. But effectively just unique identifier that representing that this is the ID and all the packets that with this ID represent a single stream. And as I promised you, uh, I just want to give you some idea of the RTP packet. Uh, so unlike um, HTTP and unlike SMTP, uh, RTP, uh, the application layer is defined in kind of form uh, of a packet that contains the fixed header part, which you can count number of bytes in there, and the um, kind of oh, optional or variable length uh, part. Like it's called the optional header, but effectively it's uh, just optional length or a variable length payload. Um, so from the important parameters here, uh, I would like to note uh, the sequence number, uh, synchronization source. <laughs> uh, so, so the synchronization source is effectively that uh, session ID, uh, which it simply identifies what is the specific source uh, for, this, uh, for this session, for this stream. Uh, there's also associated information uh, kind of describing what exactly is um, inside the payload for this session, like you described by the payload, but effectively the payload and synchronization source defines what's the stream and what's the stream type. Uh, the next important parameter is the sequence number. Uh, you will see the sequence number is part of the TCP protocol later and uh, your project too. Uh, so this sequence number has a slightly different purpose. So it's also kind of allowing you to infer uh, whether you receive something on, in order, not receiving something in order, but it's not used for any retransmission properties. So it's only used to just detect if packet was lost or packet was not lost at the receiver side. And the timestamp is a bit uh, complicated picture. And simply is kind of this field is needed because uh, this is a real-time streaming protocol or it is designed to be a real-time streaming protocol um, which requires this some kind of a clock uh, to be associated with the with the packet and uh, it doesn't have to so this timestamp is not necessarily any kind of um, kind of specific clock or like Unix uh, timestamp or anything like that. It's rather some kind of a clock that monotonically increases. And uh, whenever you receive the first packet, and as mentioned on one of the bullets on the slide, the initial uh, timestamp that's been put uh, by the server whenever the packet has been generated is randomized, and then uh, kind of the next packets are effectively monotonically increasing uh, that's, mm, that uh, timestamp depending on what the, the first byte is representing. One thing I would like to note here is that the timestamp here is actually more important than this sequence number. So that sequence number that you saw in the previous slide is just a kind of just order of packets and on, the only purpose of that field is to detect the losses. The timestamp on the other hand uh, is extremely important for the purpose of reconstructing the stream. Because even if you receive something in order, something delayed, you, you will know where to put that packet or like where how to start decoding. And in some cases, you may receive duplicate packets for the same timestamp, but hopefully the, the, the same content, sometimes it can be conflicting content, but then you still have to reconstruct your video or audio stream based on the specific timestamp. And uh, one thing that I would like to also mention is uh, intermediate synchronization or <laughs> Uh, I can also rephrase it a little bit, is about buffering. Or like, why the heck we need uh, buffering in the first place. And uh, buffering from the perspective of uh, real-time media streaming is a very needed property to ensure that you have a very smooth plane. 
just imagine for a second uh, that we don't have buffering of of any kind, and we have, we're gonna have kind of we receive uh, some packet. We'll try to play it out as soon as we receive the packet. We receive the next packet. We try to play it out as soon as we receive the packet. Uh, if we have very good bandwidth, if we don't have packet losses, and the stream of data that we send in is less than the capacity of our link, in that case, everything will be fine, and we don't really need anything of, of special. But then imagine the case that uh, we have a very, very bad connection, and a bad connection in the sense that we have very, the delay is varying uh, quite a bit. Uh, meaning like one packet will be received with the one millisecond delay, the second packet will be received with like a 50 millisecond delay, third packet will be received with 20 millisecond delay, and effectively one of the packets may arrive out of order. And I'm not even imagining this case, like if we're working on a Wi-Fi, uh, that's normal, like that's norm of uh, Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, where we have like very different uh, types of delays of the packets. And I guess you already noticed the problem, but if you have very different types of delays, you're going to play one packet, you, there will be silence, you will play the third packet, because you're right before the second one. Then you play the third packet, you play the second packet, and kind of everything is screwed up. Now, that the smart decoder will simply ignore uh, whatever it received the second packet third and will not play it, uh, but uh, essentially you already have a problem. So what you can do, you can simply delay play out by a certain amount of time. Uh, this, that certain amount of time is uh, for real time streaming really depends on a jitter because you, from one hand you don't want to delay a play out too long. I mean you can can delay for half an hour, but then in that case we're not going to have uh, like real time uh, of multimedia streaming anymore, and we're going to have so many problems. But you also don't want to delay too too little, so you have like this unsmooth pauses, kind of some blickering, jickering uh, of the stream. So you want to adjust this uh, delay to be kind of kind of close to the jitter. Okay. And by jitter, I mean uh, the variation of the uh, of the delay. If delay is stable, jitter is zero, so and you don't really need to delay too much. If jitter is high, like meaning the variation is like going from 1 to 50 to 20 to 50 to 1 again, then you have to delay by at least uh, 50, around 50, like that would be the, the value of the jitter in, in that specific case. So that's uh, kind of that's the specific role of uh, buffering in a uh, real-time stream. It has similar role in non-real-time streaming, uh, like it's also for the purpose of uh, avoiding the jittering uh, part, uh, but it has a little bit less importance because you now you can actually buffer for a longer period of time, maybe not half an hour, but uh, for a minute, for two minutes, uh, then it actually doesn't create any problem for the playback and have no real problem. And on the YouTube videos, you probably saw the kind of buffering sometimes goes uh, quite a bit. And besides the buffering, uh, it's also trying to download stuff that you haven't watched yet, but you expect it to watch in the future. So this is how basically all other uh, systems operate. And uh, just a few final words for the RTP control protocol or this RTCP. It's simply to, I already mentioned a couple of times, it's simply to provide the feedback. Um, it doesn't have too much information in there. Uh, there's a few interesting problems associated with the RTCP. It does have some form of uh, protection for the scalability. And remember, I mentioned that uh, RTP is kind of designed to multicast, sending one packet to multiple consumers. And uh, for RTCP, it's because it's reverse, there will be multiple consumers that may send those uh, packets back to the server. Uh, so kind of to avoid the problem of explosion, <laughs> explosion uh, of packet explosion, uh, RTCP has some form of a designed mechanism to mm, kind of send less packets or less controlled amount of packets back to the server. Either the guys will be sending at a smaller rate, uh, kind of giving them less information, or try to kind of aggregate information received from other guys. And uh, there are a few information that associated with the RTCP. Uh, there are quite a bit of interesting usages for the RTP, and uh, this one I just briefly mentioned. Uh, so you can use RTP not just to, uh, from the server to the consumer, just as a one step. Uh, you can actually do various kind of aggregations. So for example, uh, and that's actually the common practice for uh, like a video streaming application, like a video conferencing. Uh, 
so each individual guy can send a stream to a single party, like for example, audio from me, audio from kind of everybody in the class, uh, being sent out to a single server, that server aggregates uh, all this into one kind of mixing into one stream and then send out one stream to everybody else. So this way, I actually need to receive much smaller amount of information, yet I can hear everybody, like even, even every, when everybody is speaking. So that's kind of one use of uh, RTP technology. Uh, similarly, you can do some form of a translation where you kind of translate either between different uh, kind of standards, uh, different uh, bit rates and so forth. Or for example, in this case, it's just giving you uh, just one uh, outgoing stream, but technically that translator can convert this uh, either 8 kilobit audio or to something else like the multiple substreams. Or if we're talking about um, kind of translator in, in, as a transcoder, uh, then the one uh, single video stream, like in a high quality video stream, can be transcoded uh, into multiple different qualities and separated, uh, sent out in different qualities uh, afterwards. And uh, to conclude this, uh, this part of RTP, uh, uh, this part of the lecture about RTP, I just want to mention a few issues. So like RTP is great, it was designed, uh, kind of, it, it's working, like a lot of uh, applications are actually using it. Uh, but it has a few problems on its own. So there's a collision detection and resolutions, uh, like the, because the stream being identified the, uh, as a SSRC, uh, and if you remember from the packet format, it's a 32-bit uh, uh, value. Uh, so there is still a chance that the two sources will pick the same number. And unless the application is smart enough to resolve the issue, uh, it will be beyond the RTP. Uh, there's a, and beyond the loop detection, there's also kind of high level problem of using the multicast in the first place. Because multicast um, kind of capability of the network is actually not available globally, uh, but only available in small areas. So this is kind of an issue inherent to RTP for the purpose of uh, data distribution. Security is a good problem. Uh, as you may notice, uh, there were nothing related to the security as part of uh, the conversation that I had before. Uh, nothing, kind of absolutely nothing in there. Uh, there are some solution built on top of it. Uh, like you can always encrypt the actual payload of the protocol or put the uh, RTP not instead of just directly on top of UDP, but on top of the secure protocol. Again, it's not really part of RTP, but it has some form of uh, problems. And finally, there's a small issue of uh, redundancy of the header. Um, and it's much smaller than HTTP and SMTP header, so the problem is much, much, much smaller. Uh, and yet, because of this header has to be repeated uh, all the time, and for some RTP packets, uh, their size is relatively small. Like if you're talking about audio conferencing, uh, then sometimes the packets are like less 100 bytes because there's not enough information for the voice to be encoded or for this uh, period of time. And yet you have to add this 40 bytes. So there is a protocol for the header compression. Okay, so that's uh, all I wanted to talk about RTP. So remember, uh, this is the one of the classic mechanisms for mm, multimedia streaming. Within the RTP, uh, for RTP, you will have to have uh, two ports. So one is for the RTP itself, and uh, the other one is for RTCP to kind of get some form of a feedback. Uh, within this uh, one RTP, uh, RTCP protocol, you, have, you can have multiple sessions uh, going in parallel, uh, and you can pick and choose which sessions you want to decode, so because the receiving is actually depends on what the server is sending. And the only choice potentially you can make is if RTP protocol is designed to work or can have multiple RTP protocols running in parallel. Uh, only in that case, you will be able to kind of pick one uh, kind of high level RTP protocol using this specific port number or maybe even different IP address or uh, RTP session, it's kind of high level session on, on the other IP address and IP port. Remember about uh, jitter, uh, so the fact that the uh, kind of packets uh, can arrive with the different delays compared to, to each other. Uh, for the real-time plane, you have to have some form of a delay which should not be too high or the too long and should not be too short uh, to prevent uh, kind of jittery uh, playback of audio and video. 
and then kind of jittery is basically a measure of how flaky this delay is. And uh, buffering is effectively is representing uh, this delay of, of delaying the playback of packets for a certain amount of time.